ago, I made a video wherein I discussed a couple of common ESO trading mistakes that I'd see novice traders make on the regular. You know, things like listing items on the guild store that have absolutely no value whatsoever, listing materials only a couple at a time instead of selling stacks of 200 or some other clean and convenient number, etc, etc. The video was aimed at newer players and traders because that's the demographic that is inherently prone to make mistakes as they navigate the trading aspect of the Elder Scrolls Online for the first time. Truth is though, even veteran traders are prone to making mistakes when it comes to trading. And I'm not even talking about the whole, whoopsie, I forgot to add a zero to my item listing and someone just bought my undaunted monster mask style page for 850k instead of 8.5 mil BRB, I'm gonna go commit not living now. Even the most seasoned traders are prone to making mistakes that can't be chalked up to human error, like failing to input a zero or what have you. There are some practices that traders forget or fail to consider that I'd like to highlight in this video. But even I'm guilty of one of these mistakes on a fairly regular basis myself. In my defense, when I think about the one mistake that I sometimes make, my cope is that I can't always really be asked to stay on top of this one notion that I'll get to in a bit, I promise. I'm just mentioning this because you guys should know upfront that avoiding these mistakes relies on a consistent sense of awareness and effort on your part. That can be a huge turn off for some players that aren't super keen on trading an ESO and only really partake in it as a means to fund their housing, fashion, PvP, PvE, or ERP endeavors. So fair warning, we're gonna get into some pretty try-hard trading territory. Proceed with caution, you've been warned. And uh, if you hardcore traders out there can think of any additional mistakes that you've made, by all means, share it with the class. You might just save someone from doing the same. Alright, enough chit chat, let's get into some of the most common mistakes that veteran ESO traders make. I'm gonna start with the two mistakes that I've spent the longest time discussing first, so I hope you're nice and comfy and ready to digest this disgustingly sweaty ESO trading seminar. I'm not going to get into the whole undercutting, good or bad, debate in this video. Anytime I share even an ounce of my opinion on the notion of undercutting, I get annihilated in the comment section. <laughs> What I am going to talk about is when players unintentionally undercut guildies, sometimes by pretty substantial amounts. In the same vein, players may unintentionally end up doing the opposite. They may end up listing their wares for significantly more than they're truly worth, and subsequently more than what their other guildies are listing their identical wares for. If you price your item too low, I mean, congratulations, you played yourself, but you also may contribute to the decline in the value of whatever you just sold especially if you sell the same item frequently enough at this low ass price. If you consistently do this, you'll also potentially guarantee that your fellow guildies won't be able to sell their identical wares so long as you continue to undercut them. It's kind of BM, but I mean, I get it. Some of y'all are cutthroat. Conversely, if you list your items for too high a value, shoppers will be buying up all of the identical wares from your guildies who price their items reasonably and not you, ya bozo. This can be prevented really easily. Use the search for item function. This, aw oh man, this is such a top tier quality of life feature, man. When console enjoyers mauled in the comments of my gold guides and say that they aren't console friendly, I always direct them to this base game feature. I don't use trading add-ons myself. Have you ever seen a trading add-on in my videos? <laughs> okay, I do mention the TTC website, of course, but for real, the search function hard carries me and I'd be able to carry out my trading shenanigans without the TTC site just fine, although albeit a lot less efficiently. You really should use this feature at any time you're about to list an item on your guild trader. It's in your best interest to sell your item or items in a guild store that doesn't have any listings of that exact item. No competition, no problems. That's the nice thing about being in a couple of trading guilds. You can cycle through each one when checking up some stuff on guild stores to sell to make sure that you are ultimately listing your items in a trader that does not have any or a lot of identical listings that may interfere with how quickly you get a sale and how you go about pricing your item. Sometimes you have no choice but to list an item on a trader that already has some or even several listings of the exact same item. 
In this case, you can at least still ensure that you are pricing your item accordingly by being aware of what your fellow guildies are listing their items for. A lot of people, when they're shopping, sort their guild store item listings by way of what was most recently listed appearing first. So you honestly don't even need to undercut at all to have your items appear first to a lot of interested shoppers. Or you could undercut by something like one gold if you're a little shitter like I am. <laughs> by checking in with your guildies and seeing what they're listing the exact same item or items for, you can make a much more educated decision when pricing your stuff. Or you run the risk of debating yourself and not getting properly compensated. So use this function and be sure to always check to see how your guildies price the same items that you're about to toss in the guild store. I would generally advise against following what other people are doing without really understanding why they are doing it. <laughs> I know that sounds like kind of obvious, but I noticed that this is really prevalent when it comes to trading an ESO. This notion of understanding why an item is important is something that I try to prioritize in my content. So as to allow for my videos to still remain relevant even after a substantial amount of time has passed. You know, rather than just being like, oh yeah, sell this, sell that. Sure, perhaps one of the items mentioned in a quarterly gold guide a while back may not be super valuable now, but if we can understand why it was or why it became valuable in the first place, we have the potential of applying that line of reasoning to other items or gold strategies in the future. Likewise, we'll be able to understand why such an item may no longer be valuable. And it's this latter concept that has bamboozled the likes of even veteran traders. This mistake is most present when it comes to the notion of flipping items for profit. Some of the most financially savvy and efficient moves in the game come from investing in, i.e. purchasing a shitload of, one item before a change occurs to it or the game when its price is relatively low, and then reselling that item once the change has been implemented and the demand and price for it skyrockets. You can observe these kinds of trends through the sales of materials, gear, event writs, and more. However, further changes to the item in question or the game itself, or or the population even, can also diminish or completely eradicate the demand for an item as much as they can promote that demand in the first place. A prominent example of this that I will continue to reference to prove the main point in this chapter of the video concerns the price of key fragments. Let's take a quick walk down memory lane, shall we? Yeah, I know, I can remember the sales history of virtual items, but I couldn't remember 50 compounds from my organic chemistry exam in second year. Everyone point and laugh at this user. When the Spellpower Cure set was set to receive a major facelift quite a while back, a lot of players figured that the demand for this set in both PvE and PvP would increase. Thus, they figured that the price of key fragments would likely increase because of the potential of there being many wealthy players looking to bypass the grueling process of farming white gold tower for SPC gear by opening the gear chest with key fragments instead. Many knowledgeable traders then purchased a bunch of key fragments before these changes were implemented on the live server in preparation for this change. Once the changes were implemented, the demands for key fragments predictably increased, and those traders were ready with their hordes of key fragments stored away. Even after the changes to SPC were implemented and the rise in the demand of key fragments grew, there was still a lot of unaware traders that were completely oblivious to this change that had occurred in the game, and likewise, the market. It's why I always recommend not being overly reliant on trading add-ons that show you only the sales for an item made in the past. You need to be able to see the potential future for the prices of an item as well. Because there were a lot of unaware traders that were still listing cheap key fragments at the time, it was incredibly easy to purchase these key fragments from these players and relist them at the new higher prices that they were going for. Eventually, players caught on as their trading add-ons finally did, and flipping key fragments gradually became less viable of a gold strategy. Moreover, the Imperial City event was on the horizon, and when it eventually occurred on the live server, the prices of key fragments dropped substantially. 
as a result of so many players who normally didn't PvP, mind you, venturing into the Imperial City for event tickets and picking up lots of key fragments along the way. The supply of key fragments skyrocketed, and their prices unsurprisingly reflected that by decreasing substantially. Okay, wrap it up, Artea. Where was the mistake in this scenario? The mistake was that some people caught on to the whole key fragment craziness a bit too late. They saw that the price of key fragments was steadily increasing, but they likely had no idea why, or if the prices would ever stagnate, let alone drop. It was fair to presume that the prices of key fragments going forward would always remain higher than they had been in the past, in light of the changes made to the SPC set. But once a lot of players had received their SPC gear, the insane hype for the fragments was bound to settle, and so too with their prices. Then, of course, an event that would promote the supply of this item was also bound to wreck its value. So you had traders buying up key fragments at market value, thinking that they could get away with selling them for higher prices given their steady increase, when in reality, their prices had already settled from the hype. Moreover, those traders that showed up late to the party were in for a very unpleasant surprise. When the Imperial City event rolled through and the value of their precious fragments went into the shitter, making it so that many actually lost a bunch of gold from their unwise investments. What's worse is that a few ESO content creators were even actively promoting the notion of flipping key fragments as a valid gold strategy without truly understanding the reason why it was even viable in the first place, or better yet, why it was about to not be viable at all in light of the oncoming event that has always flooded the market in key fragments. It's almost like you shouldn't make content about shit that you don't understand for views because you can end up actually hindering your audience. Listen man, I know how much money we get per thousand views, okay? It's not worth it, did you pay your audience's brothers? <laughs> Sorry, this is a real pet peeve of mine, I'll shut up now. Did you ever think you'd hear such a compelling story about a f***ing item in a video game? To be fair, I think the key fragment example paints the perfect picture of this kind of trading mistake. As I already mentioned, the consequences of being unaware of why you're even wanting to flip an item in the first place can come from any number of items. But I'd say that this is especially common during events, when certain items experience massive spikes in their demand for short periods of time like Heartwood during the New Life Festival, or Dragonbone during the Witches Festival. Anytime you find a nice opportunity to flip an item consistently, you know, to the point where you're actively searching for it on the traders to see if you can spot any good deals, be sure to understand why it's a good idea to flip that item in the first place. That way, you'll know when it's a good time to stop flipping it. Hey, I think that segues nicely into our next point. I'm super guilty of this one. The prices for some items can be pretty malleable and subject to change at times. Event-related items are prime examples of this. Same with items that are newly released, like a new DLC dungeon motif or whenever structural furnishing plans are added as daily quest rewards. Other times, the prices of items can shift dramatically through artificial market manipulation, whether it has any lasting, durable effects on the economy or not. And of course, changes made to items, sets, or the game in general can also drastically affect the prices of items. Like, uh, oh, I don't know, I heard that key fragments were a good example of this. A mistake that a lot of traders are prone to making is initially listing their hot item or items for a seemingly reasonable amount in amounts that corresponds with what a majority of sellers are listing their identical item for at that moment in time, and then leaving that item there after some time has passed and it has not sold. In this scenario, it's very likely that this hot item is no longer selling because the value of the item has decreased for one reason or another, be it that the supply has increased, or the demand for it isn't prominent, or a little bit of tomfoolery, you know, a little bit of undercutting has occurred, and the price that one may have have initially listed that item at is no longer considered market value. Sometimes the shift in value happens after a week, sometimes after a few days, and in some cases even hours, usually depending on what the item is or how savage the undercutting is and how badly people want to not make a lot of gold for some reason. Now to be fair, the supply of these hot items plays a huge part in this as well. So don't forget about your listings, I know that's easier said than done, especially when you're in multiple trades 
trading guilds, but it may not be a bad idea to check up on the items that you've listed every once in a while, especially when you know you're trying to move a certain hot item during a time when its price is bound to decrease drastically with each day that passes because of the aforementioned reasons. This way, you can really capitalize off of the hype for a particular item and, of course, better prevent the prospect of having your listings expire. I don't use trading add-ons, so I don't have a whole bunch to say on this matter, but I know this one mistake gets a lot of people. Shit, I'm not gonna lie, I'm pretty sure I profit from it. <laughs> Take it from my friend Drakkar, who is a filthy add-on user. Get his ass, console mains, he's all yours. Drakkar always stresses how he had to blacklist one of the guilds that he was in from his trading add-ons. He didn't want those add-ons to pull any sales data from that guild. Why? because the traders in that guild were incredibly notorious for listing their items for a fraction of their actual value. He didn't want those values influencing the average sales price data that his trading add-ons would provide him because they weren't accurate. If he followed the recommended sales prices, he'd be ripping himself off. There are many reasons why someone may decide to underprice an item by a substantial amount, to be fair. It's not just ignorance. Some people have an abundance of one particular item and don't really give a damn if they aren't getting their money's worth, they just want to make some quick cash. Or for it to get out of their inventory because they already have a ton of gold, and inventory is super limited in this game. This is especially common among players that sell carries as their primary source of income. If you're not one of these people, however, but find yourself in a guild full of them, you might want to consider blacklisting that guild from your trading add-ons so that their sales do not affect the sales data that these add-ons produce for you. Typically, guilds that hold traders in less than ideal locations, such as ones in the middle of nowhere or in outlaws refuges, will have traders that underprice their items to promote sales, a completely fair practice, mind you. Then of course, items are usually underpriced in guilds that aren't trading guilds first and foremost, but rather social, RP, or PvE and PvP ones. Again, sometimes because of ignorance, or sometimes because it's a conscious decision to simply rid the item from one's inventory and make some gold while doing so. Consider blacklisting these guilds so that your add-ons can recommend the most reasonable sales data for you. Alright, that's all for now. This video has gone on long enough and I'm tired of the taste of talking. These are the most common mistakes that I see even endgame traders make in ESO, although I'm certain that these are not all of the kinds of trading mistakes that you can make. Let me know about any of the ones that you may have made that weren't discussed in this video. I'm curious to know. Thank you for listening to my I would say TED talk, but this felt like a whole damn lecture. I appreciate you sticking around, so I hope you can appreciate the trading tips that were discussed today. You know who else I appreciate? My YouTube members <laughs> for the additional support. Thanks for watching gamers, I will see ya in the next video. Cheers.